So, again, and I, I, I should not be surprised ever by the things that God does, but as I was thinking about hope this week, um, there, there are areas of my life that I've become hopeless in, and one of them this year has, has been seventh grade football. And yesterday, they came through with the first win of the season in, against Sydney, which is awesome, right? But, that, but God confirmed in me that even the little things that I'm like, we just haven't put it all together in one game. And God said, well, you're speaking about hope this week. Let me give you a little bit of hope. And um, yeah, it was, it was good. And so whatever small areas of your life that you think, oh, God doesn't care about that, um, he does. And he, he wants to speak to you in every moment of every day of your life. And if you allow him to, and you allow him to, to give you a glimpse of his heart in everything that you do, you'll begin to be able to have hope even when the world around us says that it doesn't make sense. So even seventh grade football players can give you hope, which if that's not encouraging, I don't know what it is, right? Sorry about that, Noah. I know you're up there. <laughs> oh, love that kid. All right. So, uncommon hope. Again, as, as we look at what hope is in terms of what we define it here on earth and what God says hope is, is we're going to see that it's completely different. Um, first, let's look at what, what hope in terms of uh, what the world defines hope as. Uh, in the dictionary, it says hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen, a feeling of trust. Or you might say that your hope is in a certain outcome. Okay, that's what uh, Webster says hope is. But the Bible says that hope is something completely different. Uh, Hope is confident of what God has promised and its strength in his faithfulness. Much different than what the world tells me hope is. Hope in, in terms of Our world says that I'm hoping, I can only have hope if the outcome I want to happen, happens. That if God meets my need in this way, then I can have hope. That if I pray in expectation of this, then the expectation is that it will happen the way I prayed for. But uncommon hope is not in a result or an an outcome. Uncommon hope is in a person, that of God. Not of something we hope to happen, an outcome we we expect to receive. So maybe there's been a time when you've been praying for something specifically. Maybe it's a a family member uh, that you're hoping that comes to Christ. Uh, Maybe it's a promotion. Uh, But for whatever it is, you've been praying for something specifically. And maybe God didn't answer that prayer exactly the way you had prayed for And you begin to see your hope start to dissipate and just fade because your hope was not in God himself. Your hope was in an outcome, something you were hoping to receive. And so our hope begins to waver when we don't get what we thought we were going to get. But our hope in in an uncommon way is supposed to be in Christ. And we're going to look at that this morning. Uh, So just as uh, we move through this, let's, let's look at hope's source, and we're going to look at a few passages this morning that talk about where we can get our source of hope. And the first one we're going to see is, is Lamentations chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to Lamentations chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 16. Now when I was preparing for this, I didn't just pick uh, the most obscure passages about hope, and like this isn't a store drill where first one stand up and read it, uh, there's no price for that, but um, it, it's interesting to me how, how God speaks in ways that we, we don't anticipate. And using the book of Lamentations, which, which if I can be honest this morning, is not a book that I've spent a lot of study on. And the last two weeks, God says, let's look at the book of Lamentations a little bit. So we've been camped out there the last two weeks. Um, but we're going to look at chapter 3 this morning, 16 through 24. And this is what it says. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is, so I say my endurance has perished. 
and so has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and gall. This, this sounds like a pity party, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. My life is over. It's terrible. Uh, it, wormwood and gall, it's bitter. There's nothing sweet about it. Um, you forgot, I've forgotten what happiness is, right? I think that's something maybe you've heard your kids say before. Oh, my life is awful. You won't let me have cookies before dinner. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Verse 20, my soul continually remembers, remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And then Psalm 71, 12 through 16. O God, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and praise you, yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come, I will remind them of your righteousness and yours alone. So if there's anything that we learn from these two passages is that the source of hope has nothing to do with this earth. Why? Because the author of Lamentations and David and Psalms is saying, listen, the world around you is complete chaos. If you're searching for hope in the world around you, you will be disappointed every single time. If your source of hope is in government, if your source of hope is in your finances, if your source of hope is in the election in November, you will be disappointed. If the source of your hope is not in God, then life will always disappoint you. Why? Because the world around us is in utter chaos. The world around us wants to destroy us. They, they, they are enemies of God, and they want nothing to do with God. And so if your hope is in the world, you will de- be disappointed. And if anything can be confirmed by these two passages, it is that. So let's just camp here for a moment this morning. I'm sure there's many of us that, even without us really knowing, have put hope in something other than God. Maybe it's, it's, it's hope in this year's crop, that if it yields what I have planted, then, then we'll be fine this fall and we'll be fine this winter. But have you noticed that the things that we put hope in, that this, the, the world says, believe in this, trust this, that no matter how good that person may be or no matter ma- how, how many good intentions you may have, it never really equals what you thought it was going to be. It always leads to disappointment. And so if our hope is not founded in Christ, then nothing will ever be enough. Let me just remind you of the definition of hope that we looked at earlier. The definition says that my hope is in a certain outcome. And if we're honest, that has crept its way into the church. That our hope in God is solely dependent on whether or not God answers our prayer in a certain way. He provides in this way. And so we have this outcome that we're expecting from God. And it's crept into our lives, whether we want to admit it or not. And we find ourselves disappointed when it doesn't happen the way that we had hoped. Let me share an example with you of how this practically played out in my family's life. So I've shared several times about our story as a family. I will make it through it. All right. And so Joss and I have been married 10 years in, in August. And we have unsuccessfully been able to have children. And so it's not that we haven't prayed for that. We haven't, uh, you know, sought counsel and, and, and all, of, all the things that, you know, Christians tell you to do. Um, we've 
been prayed for. We've done all the right things as, as you would define right. But we began to realize that our hope shouldn't be in this, this promise of a child. Because if the, if, the, if the hope is in the receiving of the gift and not in God, then we've missed it. I can only say that because that was this been 10 years into this journey. Not, it's, it was difficult in the moment to realize that. However, this, this, the prayers that we had, if, if we gotten what we received, we would have never had Levi. <clears throat> so five years in, we're, this is battle, we're, we're young, like everyone around us just has 17 kids. Like, why can't we have kids? Um, my brother has three daughters, and they don't even really have to try. They just look at each other, and it happens. Um, like, my, my mom has, has four boys. Like, again, didn't really seem to have any problems. So, like, I just couldn't comprehend on why this would be the case. And so five years into our marriage, we're really wrestling with, okay, we want kids, but we don't want to, like, if we're, there's other avenues we need to pursue, we don't want to wait forever because things take time and and so we're just really wrestling through what steps to take, and, and God said, why not adoption? And we're like, well, because we're pastors and we're poor, right? Like, we don't have money. There's no way we could ad- adopt a child. And, you know, it costs like $1.2 million to do that. And, and so we just, we kind of discarded it, thinking like, yeah, that would be great. We would love, we would adopt all the kids if we could. But, like, I just don't see how financially this is going to be possible. And then, like... A uh, week later, like someone at our church in, in Wyoming said, we want to give the money to you. <laughs> and I was like, what? This is $20,000. Like, you just don't give $20,000 to somebody. I don't care if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Uh, or you just don't do that. that. Like, what do you want us to do for you? How do you want us to? No, we don't want anything back. Just here's the money. So we started on this journey and if, again, along the way, if, if the hope was in a specific outcome, like none of this happens. And so our hope had to be in the Lord. So a year later, like probably less than a year, like nine months from the start of adoption process, which normally takes years for those of you who have been down that path, nine months, like the term of a pregnancy, like we get a call that like, we have been chosen, and we're like, we literally just finished the paperwork. Like, this doesn't happen. We're at church, and our, and our uh, adoption agency person calls us and said, you know, you've been chosen. We set up a meeting with this birth mom, and we're like, we thought we had more time. The baby's due in a month, and we're scrambling. Like, we're, we don't have any other kids, so we don't have, like, just stuff laying around the house. And so we're scrambling to figure this out. And then we you know, meet the, the birth mom, we, you know, she calls us the night, like, the, we met her Sunday afternoon, she calls us Sunday night and says, you know, I, I cho- chose you. Like, what? Um, again, this isn't normal, this doesn't happen. And so, then, uh, you know, a month or so later, Levi's born, and, like, everybody thinks he looks like me, which is, like, is honoring, but he's going to be, like, six foot five, and then none of you will think that he's mine. <laughs> But all that to say, the, the moral of the story, why I even bring this up, is not because I want you to look at me and think, like, oh, I'm glad you have faith, Phil. Like, that's, that's cool. But the hope in, the, in an outcome cannot be the source. Otherwise, even the miraculous adoption of, of our son would have been, like, not enough. It wasn't what I wanted originally. I didn't know that I wanted that. But God's gift to us was far greater than anything I could have manufactured. And so we don't always understand what God is doing in the moment, in the chaos. And I know for a lot of people in our community, the last few months have been chaos would be like an understatement. We have have made decisions here that I never thought we'd have to make. And I know that's been the case in the school system. That's been your, the case in, all, in your jobs. And, and I, I get that the last few months have been really difficult. 
But if your hope has been in something other than God, I'm sure you've had moments along the way that have been very disappointing because you, you did everything right. You did follow the rules. You did what you're supposed to do, and it still didn't happen. And what now, God? And if, if we're honest, there was, there was this, well, why would I follow God if this is what happens? So our source is vitally important in our hope. Because if it is anything other than Christ, you will be disappointed. I promise you that. Maybe not tomorrow, but it will happen. Because the world around us is not on our side. Okay. So how, how do we have an uncommon hope in a world that's increasingly hard to, to be a Christ follower? Because, again, there's nothing, if, if, you, if you've even, like, glanced at the news over the past few months, it's pretty hopeless. It, it honestly is. There's Outside of Christ returning tomorrow, it's, it's, yeah, it's terrible. And so it can leave you feeling like, well, what, what do I do? What are the next steps? How do I respond as a Christ follower? But we have to also see that there's, there's strength and hope as well. That, that God didn't just Bring us to this point and say, figure it out. Uh, hope in God, this, this mysterious thing, you should have it. No. He said, okay, I, you, in, if order, in order for this to work, you're going to have to hope and trust in me. But I know you can't do it on your own. This, this is impossible for you. So I'm going to give you the strength to do it. Now, that's... That just blew my mind this week as I was thinking about that. Like, we think that the Christian life is for us to figure out, and God just hopes we do it. No, he says, this is what I want from you. I'm empowering you to do it. Now, that is, that is not the God of religiosity. That is a God of someone who, who loves you, who cares deeply about you, who isn't just concerned with your performance. He, he wants what's best for you. So Paul describes it like this in Romans chapter 8. He says, remember we kind of had a background of, of Romans last week. There's this turmoil between Jews and Gentiles. One brings their religiosity back to the, to the table and says, wait, you're worshiping God in a way that we don't agree with. And they're like, well, we've been doing this without you for years, so get out of here. And there's just this tension uh, racially and just how they worship amongst the people in Rome, the Roman church. And Paul is talking about how we should treat each other as Christians, even in a hostile world. And he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected, him, who, who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption, and ob obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we, eagerly, as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For it is in this hope we are saved. Now hope is, is seen and not, is not, hope that is seen is not hope. For one who hopes... For what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Okay, so what does all that mean? The question is, where do we find strength to hope? Because it's not always easy to have hope. It's not always easy to be a person of hope. So where does the strength come from? The strength comes from the Holy Spirit who God sent to us on his behalf. What does it say? It says that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. That it is when we do not know what we need or want, he, he intercedes for us. He takes care of it. He helps us along the way. 
So when life feels hopeless, God himself gives us reason to have hope. Listen, I know you don't know what's going on in your life, but let me help you out. Let me, let me give you reasons to hope. Let me show you the way to go. Let me guide you. Like, I know you can't figure it out. I know you can't see five minutes from now, but let me help guide you along the way. Some would say, especially in our world, that, that hope is a sign of weakness, that, that because you, have, you can't do anything about your life, you just have this mystical hope about your life that maybe things will work out, that the weak ones are ones who believe in something they cannot see. It's because you cannot reason it to death. You cannot physically understand it. So the the weak-minded people, they have hope. But what does Scripture say? Scripture says that there's strength in hope. That God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so even when we don't know what to do, the Spirit prompts us. He, he gives us instruction. This is the steps you should take. This is what you should think. And re- starts to bring things to our mind that we, we didn't know were in there. We have been sold a lie, even in Christianity, that if you don't have it figured out, that there's something wrong with you. That it's not okay to admit weakness. It's not okay to admit you don't know what you're doing. That you just have to fake it until you make it. So that everyone else in this room believes something differently about you. That is a lie. The truth is, none of us have it figured out. None of us. Not me, not Pastor Matt, not anyone else in church leadership. No one has it figured out. I'm trying to figure this out in enough time to at least give you some insight to it. (laughs) That varies week to week, right? Like, this, no, but none of us have it figured out, but we believe the lie that we have to fake it so that everyone else believes that we're good Christian people. But there's strength, not in, in, in what we can accomplish, but what, is, what does Paul say? That there's strength when you admit your weakness. That when you don't know what to ask for. I mean, how, how many of you have been in those moments where you know you should pray, but you're not really sure what to say, how to ask? Like, everything that comes to your mind is like, well, that sounds pretty selfish. I'm sure we've all been in moments like that where we're not really sure how to proceed with this. But what does it say that when we humble ourselves and admit, like, God, I I don't have it figured out. I need you to intervene on my behalf. He doesn't say, sorry, figure it out. No, he says, let me guide you. Let me help you. Let me show you what it is that I have for you. So there's strength and hope. There's nothing wrong with humbly admitting that you don't have it figured out. There is strength in relying on Jesus. The strength to hope when life seems hopeless. But then we can have a confidence. Not, not only can we have, are we, uh, there's strength in hope, but we can also have confidence in hope. But what is our confidence in, okay? We know that, that Christ is our source of hope. We know that, that there's strength and hope, but, but how can I be confident in any of this? Is it just, again, some mystical idea that I just, I pray it happens. Well, let's finish Romans chapter 8 and see how Paul finished this. And he says, and he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's jump to Matthew, uh, reverse back to Matthew 28. Let's, why can we have confidence? So the, the disciples are, are getting ready for Jesus to ascend into heaven. And verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And this is, this is where we want to focus. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so how do we have confidence 
that we're, we're not just hoping in, in an ideal. How can we hope in confidence? The last part of Romans 8, we see that we can have confidence because of what? Because of God. It says that he who has started a work in you is faithful to complete it. That he has plans for you and they're good. Now I think the reason this verse is often mistreated and misquoted is because our definition of good is much different than what God's definition of good is. We think that if I do all the right things, then God will work everything in my favor. I'll be wealthy. Uh, I'll have no problems. My wife will love me. Like, I won't have to work hard at anything. It'll just naturally happen to me. That's what we define as good. But when God says that he has good plans for us, oftentimes the good plans involve suffering, which we don't really like. Because his good plan for you is to make you complete, to make you whole, to make you lacking nothing, perfect. And the only way that happens is by going through things that are difficult. So we can have hope, absolutely, that God will, that will, God will make everything in our life turn into something good. But not because we do everything right. The good in our life that he's trying to bring about is lifelong change, making us into the image of Jesus. That's the good he's talking about. He's not saying that if you wish upon a star, you will get whatever you want. Which when you pick and choose verses that you want to believe, that's often how we perceive this verse, Romans 8, 28. There's a lot of people that have entered the church with the lie that with picking out Romans 8, 28 and thinking they can do whatever they want and God will bless them. But our confidence isn't in our ability to follow the rules, our confidence is because of God, that he is working all things, even in our pain and suffering, for our good. So we can have uncommon hope. Why? Because God is working for our good. But what's the second part of this? How, how can I be confident? How can I have hope and confidence in God that he's going to do what he said he would do? The second part of this is that he chose you. He's not just stuck with you. I think sometimes that's what we believe about God, that we're just, he's just stuck with us, and so he's, he's making lemonade out of lemons, doing the best he can. But it says that before the foundations of the earth, he chose you by name, not by accident, not because he knew he'd be stuck with you anyways. He chose you. Even knowing that you would have moments where you walked away from him, even hated him, didn't want to do what he was asking you to do, he still chose you. That should give you some confidence. Not because, not in yourself, but confidence in God's plan for you. He's not just winging it. Like, wow, really threw me a curveball today. We're going to have to try to figure this out. Gabriel, would you uh, come over here? We got some things we need to try to figure out with this guy here. He really threw us a curveball. I don't know why he's doing that. No, he chose you. He knew everything you would do, the good, the right, the bad, the ugly, and he still chose you. That should give you confidence in his plan. Like, just as God, before the foundations of time, chose Levi to be our kid. Like, I didn't do anything to earn it. I didn't even pay for it, for crying out loud. Like, God chose me and Jocelyn to be his parents Picked him out, chose us, even though, like, logically it doesn't make sense. Even though it wasn't in his perfect design for adoption to even be a thing. He chose him and put us in, 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 in our family. And he chose you to be in his family. Every single part of you, even the parts that you don't like. So we can have confidence we can hope in Christ because he chose us. He's working for our good. He chose us. And then the last part is he says, I will leave you forever for you to figure it out, right? No, he says, I am with you always. Some of you are like, what translation are you reading? <laughs> no, he says, I am with you always. I am forever with you, meaning I will never be away from you. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, 
I'm, in this moment, he's physically leaving the disciples. They have no clue what's going to happen. They've been with him for three years thinking like, well, this is pretty great. We just get to live with Jesus and everything's cool. And he's leaving and he says, I will be with you. Like, what? How is this going to happen? You're physically leaving, yet he's going to be with you. Like, you can amount, like the confusion going on in the disciples' head, how is this going to work out? I would imagine their, conf- their hope in Christ, like, how are you going to fix this one? Kind of wavered a little bit. Like, then he says, now I want you to do this, 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 and this. And then by the time you finish all those tasks, I'll be ready for you. And what he says? He says to wait. Like we talked about patience last week, just waiting on the Lord. He says, go wait, and you'll know when the right time is. Okay, so it, 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 what it says to me is this, this has nothing to do with me, that, that my confidence in him being with me always is, is not if I measure up or if I do everything correctly or if I somehow magically make it through a day and, you know, only sin three or four times. Like, that's not what my confidence is, is in. It's, it's not in my ability to follow anything. He says, I am with you always, even when you mess up. Even when you decide in that moment that you want nothing to do with me. I will be with you. So we can have confidence in our hope in Christ because he's with us. He chose us. and And he's working everything for our good. This is completely different than anything our world communicates to us. As far as the news is concerned, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Just burn it down now. You might as well hunker down in your bomb shelter. Hopefully you still have your water from Y2K. You might have to boil it a little bit, but yeah, I don't know if the can, the beans and stuff are still good. You might. Fungus is good for you too, I guess, but. But everything around us tells us that there's no reason to have hope. And the world is desperately seeking a reason to have hope. And honestly, nothing that will happen on this earth other than the return of Christ will ever give anybody hope. Everyone thought, when I get my stimulus check in the mail, that'll be reason for hope. And now, like, where's the next one, right? (laughs) It's just fleeting. Sweet, now we bought everything on Amazon. Where's the next check? But when we put our hope in temporary things, the things that this life wants to offer us, we're always disappointed, but our hope and confidence has to be in Christ. That is going to be uncommon to the world around us. That will give people a reason to ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. They're going to say, you know, you look like you have it all together. Let me ask you a few questions. They're going to see, like, life is awful and you're handling it, like, amazingly well. I don't know how you keep it together. I don't know how, like, you have hope in the tomorrow. I don't know how you wake up with a positive attitude. And that's going to speak to people because nothing is encouraging that at all. Now, this doesn't mean that life isn't hard. It doesn't mean that everything just works out the way you hoped it worked out. What it does mean is that I can have hope and confidence in the one who does have it figured out, who does know tomorrow, that I have no reason to be afraid, I have no reason to not have hope, because he holds tomorrow in his hand. And if he chose me for the beginning of time, he's surely aware of tomorrow. And if he chose me thousands and thousands of years ago, then he absolutely knows what's going to happen in November. But my hope in in God should never have anything to do with what's going on around me. That is why it's uncommon. It has nothing to do with my circumstances. And I think in a time where there's a lot of uncertainty, that nobody has any clue, things that you thought were pretty predictable are no longer predictable. And if anything, God has blown the doors of his kingdom wide open and says, here, let me show you what you have been resisting all this time. It is a perfect opportunity for us as a church, Big C Church, to be able to speak life into people in our community. People need a reason for hope. And we are the ones who have that reason. And we have that reason in Jesus. Let's pray. God, we must admit that 
looking at what it looks like to be uncommon, look, to be a follower of yours in uncertain times, that's, that's really hard. We're, we're so easily distracted and discouraged by, by life, by difficulty, and we're very quick to blame you. And God, I, I pray that we'd be quick to praise you instead. That we would praise you in the storm. That we would know that no matter what is going on, we can have a hope that is unwavering because our hope is in you. Not in any promise from any single person, but in you and you alone. As we learned about in our our Sunday school class, Lord, uh, teach us to trust you. Teach us to, to have hope in you, even when we have our doubts. Show us how to be like you so that we can be a mirror image of you to a world that is hurting and broken, who desperately needs hope. Help us to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.